All right, so I'm Aaron. I grew up in church, and this here is a book that I got from the Longford Baptist Church in 1987, The House on the Rock. What a parable this is. What an awesome parable. We're going to read that one first, but how good are the parables? In our society today, there is so many good parables. We've got the lost sheep, the lost coin, the prodigal son, the the parable about the tenants, the workers in the vineyard who get work for a fair day's pay, the mustard seed, the sower. These are all stories that we hear so many words about, so much teaching on, and, and they give us so much depth into our life. And we're going to read this one in uh, Matthew chapter 7. The wise and foolish builders. Therefore, who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall. Because it had its foundation on the rock, but everyone who hears the words of mine and does not put them into practice like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose and the winds blew against that house and it fell with a great crash. Now this is a story that from my early days of giving my life to Christ in 1998 as a 16 year old has been a parable that has helped me through many situations. And there's so much we can grab out of that parable. Like, have you ever seen a house built on rocky land? Well, I live in Tranmere and up on the hill it's all rock. So at 7 a.m. you know someone's building a house on rock. <laughs> They're up there for weeks knocking that rock out to get their foundations right for that house. But then you get a foundation on the sand, they get the vacuum cleaner in, suck the sand out and down it goes. And there's so many things like that out of this story that our relationship with Christ takes time to build a solid foundation. To build a solid foundation on rock, it takes time to get everything set. And, and out of relationships, they actually do take time. Like if my relationship with Kel, I didn't just meet Kel and all of a sudden we're married. We build a relationship, I got to know her, she got to know me and somehow she decided to marry me. <laughs> and there's so much good teaching in this. But when Jesus was speaking of these parables, when Jesus was sharing these parables, it wasn't for in-depth teaching to these people. Jesus was sharing these parables to the Israelites to create a crisis in their life, to get them to change, to prepare them ready to change, to turn towards him and not the new covenant and step away from the old covenant, which the Israelites didn't do. So Jesus was there trying to create just a stir, a crisis in their lives to try and change these people. This morning, I want these parables, I want Jesus to create a crisis in our life that we might be able to turn back towards him, that we might be able to strengthen our relationship with him. I'm an electrician, if you don't know, I've been a sparky. I started my apprenticeship the same year that I gave my life to Christ and I got through that apprenticeship in Longford, Tasmania. Um, and at the end of that apprenticeship, uh, in my relationship with Christ was, it, it had been strong and it was starting to dip off and I finished my apprenticeship, got myself into a situation and I just didn't know what to do. And like any young guy that's just become a tradesman, I packed up my bags into my Ford Falcon XR6 and headed for the spirit of Tasmania and slingshot to Sydney. Which ended up being a pretty good move because if I'd never done that, I wouldn't have met Kel and I wouldn't have four beautiful kids and a beautiful wife. So I find myself, we're in the outskirts of Sydney, uh, get planted in the same church as Kel. My brother's already there. And that's, that's why I've chose that area because my brother was there and um, just really focused on serving in church, getting involved in church. And uh, about 18 months later, uh, became the youth pastor of the church. 
oh, now that's pretty big. And I'm like, oh, gee, look, going to sew in, going to push in and had an awesome team. And, and that church is, you know, it's really going well, going well. And we have this pastor that decides that he wants to be driving around in all these flash cars and then decides he's going to leave and he's le- left the church in a huge financial hole. And so as a youth, youth pastor, you know, we start to try and work around that. And, you know, the thing of finance is it's so hard and it was probably a, such a challenging thing in my life. And, you know, I've heard people talk around finances before, you know, oh, I don't want to give to, to church because I'm not sure what they're doing with my money. And, and you know, out of that whole situation for me and, and the struggle around that was that, do you know what? God's called me to be generous. God's called me to give to church. And, and what they decide to do with the money, it doesn't matter because I'm going to honour God with what I've got in my life and I'm going to sow into what that. So then we get these new pastors come in. Everything's looking good. Everything's up. And then uh, this pastor decides that he wants to sleep with his secretary. So the church takes another nosedive and, and, and things just go from worse to worse there. And, but, you know, we just continue to sow in, continue to push in. All right. So then we get, I, then Kel and I enter a relationship and we get married, the best thing that's happened in my life other than Jesus Christ. All right, now we're going we're gonna to go down through here in Matthew chapter 7. So we've got Jesus here. He's telling parables. He's going through. And then we get to the end of chapter 8. And Jesus decides to depart. And this is the story about where Jesus calms the storm. And in Matthew chapter 8, we're going to start. It says, Then he got into the boat with his disciples and followed him. You know what? These guys had a massive passion for Jesus. That they would do anything. They, 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 you know, everything's happening where all these guys left their careers, they're jumping in the boat. And then it says, suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. He's tired. He's just fed the 4,000 people. Earlier in Matthew, he's been teaching the, the Israelites for, for days. He's tired, he's sleeping. Now, who does Jesus have in the boat with him? He's got his disciples. He's got four people that used to be fishermen. Great on a boat. Absolutely, you, you know, if you, you, you want to be on a boat with anyone, you want to be on the boat with experienced fishermen. They're out there trying to catch fish in, in anything, make a living. They come to Jesus and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. Doesn't feel like much of a, a rock situation, does it? Doesn't feel like... Oh, like when we get into circumstances and situations like that, I want to trust my, as a fisherman, if I was a fisherman and I was on a boat, I'm, I'm not going to Jesus the carpenter. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going over there. I am going to the fisherman. All right, we've got a bit of a situation here. <laughs> Boat's not looking good. Uh, we need to get back into shore. But they go to Jesus. Like, this is a guy that understands all aspects of life better than any of us. He understands what you're going through in your circumstance, in your situation, better than anyone. He might not have ever been through that situation, but he's the creator. He's the creator. He understands us. And, and, and through my life, all these struggles of, I always keep coming back to the house on the rock. And I'm always afraid that 
I was the guy that built the house on the sand. And, and, and as you go through this book, we get to the end. And we've got the guy in the water that, and his hat's floating there. And in this book, if you look at the hat, the name in that is Done. Why would they give a little kid a book where the guy that built his house in the sand, the name Dunn, which is my last name, <laughs> on the hat? I keep thinking about that. And it wasn't... They, they didn't print it in there on purpose because Kel's seen another copy of the book and it's got the same word in there. <laughs> But so often we can be scared about life and, and feel that we're maybe not made the right decision in our relationship with Christ or that we haven't spent enough time in the Word or we haven't spent enough time praying and we think, well, I'm not good enough. I built my house on the sand and, and maybe I should just give up on this whole situation because... You know, when, you know, when houses start moving like that, you know, and you get cracks everywhere and the foundations look, we're talking about masses of dollars, masses of work, and you don't want that. And, and sometimes in my life I've felt like that. As we go on, Jesus replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? How many situations do we we enter as adults the pressures of life financially, relationship breakdowns within families. How many situations like that are we afraid of the outcome? Like this storm's come up. These guys are afraid. It's not like, you know, the fishermen were awake and, and the other guys have gone to the fishermen and let's get this boat in. We need, to, we need to turn our nose into the wind so we're not going to get capsized and we'll do this and we'll, we'll safely get back to shore. They've gone to Jesus. Then he got up and rebuked the waves and the wind. Why would he rebuke? the waves and the wind. You know what, that's, that's probably another good preach because this story leads into Jesus restores two demon-possessed men. Like maybe this was an attack from the devil. Maybe this was, you know, a spiritual storm that, that caused up the winds. Maybe it wasn't. Do you know what, there's so many different things in our life that can hold us back. Our own selfish desires, our flesh, chasing after the things of this world. And then we do here maybe have the things of the devil coming against us. We have spiritual attacks. It doesn't really matter in this situation what kind of an attack it is for this message on re-surrender. It doesn't matter what kind of at attack it is because they all come against us. They all come against our relationship with Christ. They all try and sap the passion. They all try and sap that zeal that we should have for our first love. And do you know what? Passion is not something that's based or should be based or feelings. A great worship time. Oh, that prayer time was so good. We need to have a passion and a zeal for the Lord because of our relationship that was built on the rock, that was built on Him. So, so often early in my relationship with Him, it was all about the feelings that I got through worship, through prayer, through the Holy Spirit, whatever it might be. Oh, I'm really feeling God's close to me at the moment and, and you know, I want to praise Him because of that. I want to I want to uh, read the word because of that. And the passion comes out of those, came out of those feelings, but that's not something that is always going to be there. Sometimes God feels distant. Sometimes he feels close. But the fact of the matter is that when you build your house upon the rock, when you trust on his word, 
that he died on the cross for us that he gave up his son for us. When we start basing our relationship and our passion and our zeal come out of that, it doesn't matter the situation we get in. So then we get to 2010 and we have our beautiful son, Ryder. Look at that beautiful hair down there. (sighs) Makes me feel bad. (laughs) Hopefully he can keep it. And, and living in Sydney, it's pretty chaotic. And the, the time that we'd had in our church there, um, it was always a kind of a plan of mine to, to, to go out, find a wife and come back to Tasmania. So I did that, 2010. As a tradie in Sydney, you're working long hours. You're, you're on the road. Um, if you've ever been to Sydney, the traffic during peak hours is bad. There's the M5. When I was there, it cost $3.70, and we used to call it $3.70 all day parking because you wouldn't move. Um, so we packed up, we moved to Hobart, and Kel and I started looking for a church, and we, we spent from January to about October shopping around, whatever you want to call it, because when we decided that we wanted to get planted in church, we wanted... We're here, for, we're here through thick and thin. thin. We doesn't matter what the leader, you know, what, what people do. Didn't matter if pe- what people do, we were going to be planted in this house. So we, we ended up here. And then, I'm guessing 18 months later, we were, or 12, 12 months later, we were youth pastors here. Um, we had the ple- pleasure of um, seeing a generation uh, rise up and, and serve in this church, which was awesome as well. And then we go on. So Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked him, what kind of man is this? What kind of man is this? Matthew doesn't go on to, to answer that question. He leaves it up to us, the reader, to answer that. What kind of man is he in your life? What kind of man do you want him to be? You know, for me, he's a man that I am passionate about. That sometimes it doesn't always appear that I am. And sometimes my actions might not even show that because of the things that we go through in life. But ever since I gave my life to Christ as a 16-year-old, I've never walked away from church. I've never walked away from His people. There's been times when, like I said, I'll come to church and I'll sit there, switch off, um, out of struggle and heartache. This is the first time I've preached for, I don't even actually know how long. I actually, when we had our first 60 second talk last week, uh, talked to Asher and Bailey and uh, they said, oh, you preached the first time Asher came. And I'm like, oh gee, I don't even know when that was. But I was scheduled to preach last year. March 28th. But there was things that happened in my life and I didn't feel like I could do that. And like I was talking about these relationships, when I packed up and moved to Sydney in 2003, had a, so I've got a brother and I had a sister and All right. So my sister was young. She was still in high school. I was, I'm an adult. I move off. Don't really know her that well. But she moved to Sydney to live with me for one year. <sighs> While she was there, she gave her life to Christ. Kel and I baptised her.
Last year in March, she was found dead in, in her hallway. Just give me a sec. That year to get to know her and baptise her, there's been people getting baptised the last few weeks, which is awesome every time I cry. <laughs> but last year when I was on to preach, I didn't feel up to it. Didn't really feel up to much. She's 34 years old with a four year, single mother, four-year-old kid, dead in a hallway. Things like this happen in life. And this is when we really need Jesus in our life. And you know what? I, I kept coming to church and at times switched off, at times cried, felt like I was sitting by myself because I think kids was on, Kel was on kids a lot and just sat in, tried to find a spot with no one on one of those single seats when we're doing the COVID thing and, and, and sit over there and cry. But things like this happen in our lives to shake us, but they change us. And it, it's good to be back up here. It's good to be sharing with you guys. And it's good to be in a family that is there to support and encourage you in any situation. And it's good to have a God that's there to look after you in any situation. We've always got excuses to withdraw to go back within our shell. But God wants us to give our life up to Him. In Matthew 6, 33, it says, but first seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness. I'm gonna get you guys just to stand up. If you're here today, and you're in a tough situation, or you're in a place in your relationship with Christ that you're not sh sure exactly where it is and you want it to be better and you wanna have a passion and you wanna resume and you wanna re-surrender to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You know what, God's created a place here this morning for that. We're gonna sing and we're gonna worship and if you, are in that place, you know what, I'm gonna invite you to come forward. No matter your circumstance, no matter your situation, He is the master of all. He can help you in any situation because He understands. He's the one that sent His Son to die on the cross. And 1 John 3, 16 says, and this is, how we know what love is, that He laid down His life for us. And you know what? And then it goes on to say, so we ought to lay down our lives for our brother. And you know what? That's why we're in a church. That's why we're in a family. So we can help each other through these times.